And it is my great honor and privilege to welcome you all here today, those participating in person as well as online. As director of AIR, I am committed to fostering a culture of inclusion and belonging, to creating spaces where everyone feels welcome and is able to bring their whole selves to this place and to the work that we do together. We cultivate this culture by respecting all forms of knowledge and all points of view. We acknowledge that the University of Arizona sits on the ancestral homelands of the Thanaatham and the Pasquayaki people, whose relationships with this land continue to this day. We offer gratitude to the land and the people who have stewarded it for generations and commit to sustaining relationships that recognize and acknowledge the people, cultures, and histories that make up our community. It is in this spirit of inclusion, belonging, and gratitude that we gather here today to listen, learn, and share our perspectives on resilience. The Arizona Institute for Resilience was conceived three years ago from the vision of Dr. Betsy Cantwell and with the leadership of Dr. Jim Beiser to serve as a convener across campus and beyond, a supporter of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research activities, partnerships, innovation, and education, and to foster synergies among students and researchers across disciplines, which are typically siloed in most universities. The goal of AIR is to be a catalyst for developing solutions that will serve our local to global communities to better understand and adapt to all types of systemic shocks, including those stemming from climate, ecosystems, health, economic, social, and cultural phenomena. AIR is meant to explore and develop resilient solutions with campus and community partners. The idea and design of today's event emerged from a conversation that I had with a faculty member shortly after I arrived here in August. This faculty member shared with me that they wanted to learn about and connect with others across campus whose work would complement their own, but they didn't know how they could do that in the midst of their already full days that they spent doing research, teaching, and service. So this event was born out of that longing for us to find people across this large and diverse campus to collaborate with and learn from. So the purpose of today's event is is a mystery. No, it's the previous slide. Thank you. The purpose of today's event is celebration, motivation, and inspiration. We're here to celebrate the innovative and imaginative work of a diverse group of student, faculty, and staff researchers who are embracing and exploring concepts of resilience. We are here to be motivated by the thoughtful and creative work of our colleagues to explore new ways of knowing and connecting to the work of people across our campus. And we are here for inspiration, to be open to ways in which the experiences that we have today may transform our thinking that may lead to new forms of action in the world. Our agenda for today, oops, our agenda for today will be fast paced and interactive. We do not have any formal breaks in the agenda, so please feel free to take a break when you need it and then rejoin the conversation. After our welcoming remarks, we'll have a series of nine short talks from a diverse group of speakers who have been asked to share their perspectives on resilience. We'll then have an interactive speed networking activity where the audiences in person and online will have a chance to meet and share their knowledge and experiences. Then we'll move to a moderated panel discussion where the panelists will reflect on what they've heard during the short presentations. From there, we'll have another round of five short talks followed by an interactive exercise called the reciprocity ring. To prepare for this activity, start thinking about a need that you have in your work or your life phrased in the form of a question that someone here might have an answer to. More instruction on that exercise later. And we'll have a brief reflection on the second set of talks and then a wrap up that includes an announcement of a new and exciting funding opportunity for you all to consider. We'll end the day with a reception in the beautiful ENR2 courtyard where you'll be able to continue conversation about today's activities while enjoying some good food and music. 
So thank you all for being here. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Betsy Cantwell, Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Impact here at the University of Arizona. Thank you, Betsy. Not wild about standing in front of my own picture. So um, welcome, everyone. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't state that this institute is hardly my vision. It's really built on true vision on the part of some people who are still here and in this room today, uh, including Diana Liverman, who I'm very grateful to see here uh, in developing the original Institute for the Environment and in, in going through a thought process associated with you know, do we create a new college? You know, a lot of things that you all remember from about a decade ago. So when I got here, I really asked the institution to step it up a notch and ask the question about where are we going with regard to taking all of that and delivering even more value to uh, the social systems, the human component of the grand challenge associated with climate and environment uh, and resilience. So, so, um, so it's been a long journey for this institution uh, to get um, to Sharon and this moment. Um, and there are a ton of things I could say, uh, but each of you is, and even your students are more uh, embedded in and committed to the scholarship associated with this world of resilience than I am. So I'm just going to give you a sense of why it's important to the university and why it's important to me. So our research, you know, organization centrally within the University of Arizona has a few very large institutes of which AIR is one, which are committed to taking the traditional academic divisions and units and colleges that we remain associated with at this institution and bringing them into collaborative capacity to address very significant societal challenges. Um, so, so we, you know, we deliver some capacity for an institute like this to literally support itself, but we expect you to um, grab the permission that an institute like AIR offers uh, to think big uh, and uh, question one another and um, and not start with the reasons you can't do something, but with the reasons that we might be able to take on some new idea or some capacity. And then Sharon will come and talk to me and we'll begin to work with our entire larger institution about how do we make that so. Um, nothing is easy in the world anymore. If you don't know that, just the way we live, uh, then I will say it's, it's certainly no, no different here, but I do offer you my personal permission to um, have the right large scale integrative work with your peers, address grand challenges, thoughts to start and come down to the problem areas, the yeah buts at some later date. Use this opportunity to do that. Um, I, don't know, I'm, I think you're going to hear a lot about AIR and how it functions and what uh, it will do, but I do want to encourage you to understand that these, these integrative uh, institutes that operate out of my office typically have seed funds associated with them. They have different mechanisms for doing things. I tell you that, again, to encourage you not to worry about that at the start and to start with what are the right ideas for this community, the things that we can take on together, the things that you can do. Um, and if some of them include, we have got to have a new this, that, or the other thing, that's fine, but don't start there. Uh, I think that really, really constrains you uh, too much. Um, I'm not sure, I have all these notes about what a great, cult. this is an amazing culture, this institution. Sometimes it feels like we're a little bit um, slow, but that's not um, all of you. That is sort of bureaucratically, which maybe is built in for a purpose. And so uh, I also encourage you to grab the cultural components of this institution that additionally give you permission to reach to your colleagues, even sometimes people who aren't here haven't been able to make it, and get those um, ideas framed in a way that Sharon can help move all of this forward to uh, solutions for human beings who 
work and live together in social constructs across the planet because we desperately need it. And we need it more desperately now than we did a decade ago and more desperately a decade ago than a decade before that. This problem is not getting easier. It is getting more complex. So I give you my final permission is to really embrace, embrace complexity, drive yourselves towards the most complex problems in this process as opposed to the simplest, because that's where we have to go. Thanks, Sharon. And I will just be here for a few minutes. I uh, more in the fact that I can't stay for longer, but I'm so glad to see all of you here. Thank you so much, Betsy. All right, so we have our first set of nine short talks. I'm going to ask the speakers to come up as they're on the schedule and introduce themselves to save a little bit of time so that I'm not in, uh, coming up and down each time. So we're going to start with Eleanor McMahon. Thank you. So, this is, uh, go this way, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are on the first slide. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, okay, so this is my introduction. Um, I am the uh, first associate dean for research in this institution ever in the arts. Uh, so this is the perspective that I'm bringing to the situation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It'd be so cool if you could change them for me. And I can just talk and not worry about it. I have, they're well marked, so we can go to number one. Okay. So uh, this book, <clears throat> this is the frog that always enters whenever I have anything to say to a large group of people. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this book is the reason I'm standing here now. And it's the result of the desire to understand and bring attention to regional water. It was also an experiment led by artists to see how knowledge is acquired, circulated, and disseminated through multiple disciplinary lenses. Next slide, please. Uh, the two-year project funded by Confluence Center, originally titled Parallel Play, involved community artists, Tucson Water employees, public school students, UA faculty in several disciplines, and art and architecture students. This one event drew over 5,000 people to our site in the Dry Rito Riverbed. At one point, uh, next slide. At one point, I noticed that the line on the USGS hydrograph on the right which shows the depletion of the groundwater at our site since 1940 looks like a river. So I used it on both covers. I'm showing you this as an example of the point I wanna to make today. When people realize the same line can mean opposite things when framed as art on the front cover and science on the back cover, the disappearance of a river, um, they are invited to question their own habits of seeing, thinking, and knowing. So what is art? Uh, I think we all know that art can be anything, and anything can be art. But what makes anything in particular art? According to philosopher Alvin Noah, art is not a phenomenon to define, but a process to understand a form of research into what we are and what we do. His criteria for anything to be art is that it must reveal how we as human organisms are organized by habits of thinking and acting, which are normally hidden to us. Art allows us to see those patterns of living and shows us the possibilities for reorganizing ourselves internally. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about knowledge. Accepted ideas of knowledge are based on computational theories of mind. In recent years, a radically different model has been emerging from the cognitive scientists, sciences. This new understanding of how we actually think is referred to as the inactive view. It sees the mind as embodied, inactive, extended and embedded 
in the dynamic interactions of sensing, moving, living organisms, and environments. In his essay, Embodied Knowing Through Art, philosopher Mark Johnson asks us to think of knowledge not as a noun, a collection of facts, but as a verb, knowing as a process. So what does this have to do with resilience? The point I want to leave you with is that art is not a luxury. It is not a distraction from the grand challenge of understanding and building resilience. It is an essential form of research which can help us understand how we come to know ourselves, to know our world, and in turn be able to change our habits of thinking and acting. Artist researchers are often missing from interdisciplinary collaborative research teams or brought in after research in other disciplines is completed to make the results accessible to a broad audience. But to glean the most benefit from arts research, artists need to be not just at the table, they need to be part of the decision on how the table is made. And this is happening right here and now as I stand here and talk to you as an artist in this event. Um, and I spent the morning reading proposals for arts, humanities, and resilience grants made possible by air. In the descriptions of these vibrant artist-led resilience building projects, um, I, and in this event right now, I see the contents for the next book in the series, The Art, Design, and Science of Resilience. Let's do it together. Great, thank you. Derek Lemoyne, Economics. We'll jump right in since we've got limited time. Uh, thank you for Sharon, to Sharon and to Betsy for having me and for organizing the event as well. It seems great so far. So what do economists bring to the table in thinking about resilience? I'll, I'll give you four different avenues you can contribute. So the first is we have well-refined by now methods for measuring causality in, me in messy social science, real-world data. Lots of health effects we postulate either in theory or see in the lab. Question about what translates when you actually apply them to humans, living in humans' messy world, you don't want to experiment on them. We learned about PFAS from a workshop like this, uh, Boguo and Hydrology taught us about them. We figured out pretty quickly there was a causal experiment to run. Get a big population of houses, some happen to be downstream in groundwater terms, not in observable terms of where the PFAS are going to flow to. Some happen to be upstream compare health outcomes between the two, and we can identify what PFAS is responsible for. It turns out there's big effects, and this is the first real world evidence of actual impacts in humans in their actual life of PFAS. Uh, second, so we can also think about tools for resilience. So this is a similar thought experiment. This is with Laura Backenson and Policy and a co-author at Columbia. So the weather forecasts are a tool for adaptation. They don't matter if people don't act on them, if they don't use them. Do people use weather forecasts in the real world? So what we're doing is we're taking days that look the same, have the same temperature, same observable weather conditions, same time of year, everything. Some happen to be properly forecasted. Some happen to have forecasts that were a bit too cold or a bit too warm. The plot on the far left, uh, the blue line, no effect of mortality when it's really cold. And you said it was going to be a bit colder than it actually was. But the red line shows mortality is higher. If given the exact same temperature, you said it was going to be a bit warmer than it turned out to be. The far right, it flips when it's really hot out. If you say it's going to be even hotter, no problem. But if you say it's going to be too cold, people don't take enough of an action. People do use forecasts, suggesting forecasts are a tool for climate change adaptation and suggesting there's big equity impact implications of forecast quality around the world and within communities around the US. Uh, the third, so we can also trace out non-obvious consequences of different policies. So as one example, this is with a former student at Cornell. The, what we're doing is think about how do you, what's the optimal portfolio for funding climate adaptation around the world look like? You think about, you have a pot of money, where should you invest in around the planet? It's going to depend on how does climate change affect temperature and, and physical outcomes in a location? How is the location affected by those outcomes? Some locations are more exposed than others, partly driven by income. And then less obviously, it's going to depend on how changes in one region affect the others through supply chain and trade effects. So I don't want to offend anybody by naming names, but you can imagine that region X might be best protected by protecting region Y that is upstream of region X in a supply chain or in a food trading relationship. 
So we can empirically account for those effects in data and then look at equity efficiency trade-offs and how do you design portfolios to fund projects around the world. The insight's not incredibly novel, but at some level it is, and we can show how to actually implement it. And it, it may not be the, the first thing a non-economist would think about. The last and closer to my heart is also using economic theory to get at the nub of, of a new issue. So if, as a theorist, if I think about what's different about climate change, the first thing that jumps out at me is we don't actually know what the damages are. The damages extend out into the future. We haven't run the experiment yet. And it's not like pollution where some areas are more exposed than others due to, to past high concentrations. So if we don't know what the damages are, we don't know how to price the emissions that drive climate change, making it very hard to recommend policy. But it's also different in that lots of people do know their own damages because they are exposed to it and they have an incentive to figure out what their exposure to climate change is. So then as a theorist, let's think about designing a market that reveals what people believe about climate change damages and so it both acts to collect information and to control the emissions that are driving climate change and to incentivize removal of those emissions after the fact. One other thing that pops out of that is it's important not just to be projecting future damages, which is an exercise a lot of us are involved in, but we should start trying to measure recent damages from climate change, which the natural sciences have touched on a bit in attribution studies, and, the, and geography has also been involved more in this. We need to be thinking about more run-of-the-mill damages, just some extreme heat in a given year, extreme coal, whatever it might be. There are a lot of other next generation issues that are not climate change, as much time as climate change consumes in our mind. So what is different about ocean acidification? What is different about nitrogen deposition? What is different about light pollution? And then building a theory model to strip that down and then think about the policy implications would be, would be where economists can also come in hand there too. So thank you very much and look forward to the remaining talks. All right, hello, my name is Laura Meredith, um, and I am studying uh, interactions between soil, uh, within soil between microbes and plants. Um, and so when I was uh, thinking about resilience, um, I really thought about these microbes and plants as embodying um, resilience and the types of ways that we can think about um, sort of learning from them. Um, and so are they the, the incarnations of the type of resilience that we would like uh, to emulate? And so I'm going to walk through some of the study systems we have and sort of point out the key um, aspects of resilience that maybe we can learn from. Um, first, in our research, we've asked how do plants, plant microbiomes, and the soil microbiomes respond to extreme stress. So here you're seeing uh, a picture of uh, very stressed, drought, droughted soils and um, plant litter, and then on the right, a rainforest um, biome that is rewetted and uh, is uh, responding positively back to that. So a key to res resilience in this large-scale experiment that we ran at the Biosphere 2 tropical rainforest um, was that there was a diversity in the microbial um, a way that they dealt to, with the drought and then also in the way that the plants themselves were able to um, respond to drought. And it was really the um, diversity in these functional responses to drought um, that carried the whole ecosystem through in its uh, carbon and water cycling and capacity to mitigate this extreme stress. And so from this, um, this illustration, we can learn that diversity in the way that we respond to stress is one way to uh, ensure resilience. Um, another system we work in are urban ecosystems. And so here we can ask how um, will these ecosystems respond to what we think is a, a change in a positive fashion. So there's a lot of emphasis on green infrastructure and water harvesting in Tucson. And so here we've looked at what that means for um, the resilience of degraded ecosystems and their ability to become more healthy and healthier soils. And so what we found here is a key to resilience is that the soil microbial population still has latent diversity and latent functions that are available. And when the conditions have been improved, for example, with the green infrastructure, we see that they're able to make use of that and become more healthy. So having a readiness um, is important for resilience. Uh, another system that we work in is at the Maricopa Agricultural uh, Center, where we um, have done some experiments looking at the relationship between plants and microbes under this uh, large-scale gantry, where we look to see how their relationships um, 
cause the phenotypic variation you see here, which is differences in how big the plants are and how well they can produce grain, um, et cetera. And so a key here under this really hot agricultural environment where nutrients come in um, really strong pulses, they're not available all the time, uh, is this cooperation between the plants and their microbiomes. And so um, this interaction or cooperation has been important for the resilience, especially of key into, um, uh, relationships between certain genotypes and their microbiomes in maintaining resilience. Uh, and the last example I'll share is that one thing we do is we really try to look into at a smaller scale how microbes in the soil and their consortia are interacting. And these ways are often cryptic to us if we're looking at the soil from sort of a global large scale that they are interacting and exchanging nutrients and resources at a very small scale um, and that that sort of cycling is allowing them to persist in ways um, and deal with stress in ways that we may not sort of see at a larger scale. And so I think the key to resilience here is um, that there can be cryptic use or local use of resources and that resourcefulness can help systems be more resilient than what we might expect at a larger scale. Um, and so when I was looking at the definitions of resilience, because um, this isn't my research area per se, um, I was struck that some of it was really focusing on an ability to bounce back, so to be elastic and get back to where you were, or to be tough and withstand uh, difficulties. But when I think about microbes and soil, I really think about them um, finding ways to be better adapted to their environment and better suited for survival in their environment. And so through the discussions here, I'm really um, looking forward to learning from you to think about how we as humans kind of fit into that and can learn from the plants and microbes um, to be better suited to our environment and resilient to changes that are, uh, that are here. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Michael Kutetua Johnson. I'm a faculty member of the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, but I'm also attached to the Indigenous Resilience Center. So it's kind of fun that we're talking about resilience. So, you know, the indigenous ways of knowing value added resilience. So what is value added resilience? Resilience is basically taking our own personal values and kind of adding to it uh, because the backbone of a lot of ways of knowing are that. It's just this relationship that we have that, that makes what we do so resilient. You know, why, why is that important? Because, you know, indigenous peoples protect 80% of global biodiversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land with less than 5% of the population. We have to ask ourselves, why is that true? What are they doing right that we're not doing? And it has to do with resilience. And so beyond this, underlying all that is not necessarily the processes and techniques because they're all basically uh, place-based but it's the cultural belief system that supports what they're doing and establishes that firm relationship that we have with the environment. Very hard to understand, but it, it, it can work. And so when I'm talking about that, I'm also looking at, you know, incorporating some of my own values. And so this is just a simple picture up at Hopi. It's a prophecy rock. I call it our life way to sustainability. You'll see a number of uh, figures going up here, which represents us. And you'll see one man down here planting with his, with his cornfield. You have to understand now that corn in our way of life is ingrained from us as a little child. And so what this is telling us is that we're in this particular period right now that we're all moving this way up this, this kind of a crooked path, which represents a number of things. And you'll see down here this gentleman uh, planting corn in his field and his land goes off the rock. So what this is saying is that, you know, uh, currently we have a chance to go back down here. We have a chance to, for at least for Hopis to reinforce their own culture, their own belief system, and continue what we're supposed to do here, and that's the farm. You know, and as long as we're holding true to those values, we'll, we truly will be resilient and we'll define the definition once again. So uh, one more example of this is our Hopi agricultural uh, calendar. This, this is basically um, our calendar that we use, uh, kind of put it in a Western fashion. I'm trying to combine both Western science and traditional ways of knowing to come up with some really good solutions. And so I'm not able to do so unless I'm invited to the table. So I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> and so, you know, this basically integrates um, our ways of doing things in, uh, based upon the moon and stuff like that. And this is how, uh, so basically at Hopi Society, there really is no separation between our cultural belief system and our agricultural system. And again, that's just another example of resiliency. And so, but at the heart of this resiliency is what does value really mean? 
you know, we, we talk about numbers, we try to quantify everything, but we really need to address uh, what the values of our community to make that truly resilient. Because if we all can buy into these values of whatever they may be, we're able to have tremendous amount of what I would call um, uh, impact. Impact's a big word here at the University of Arizona. And so, you know, this, this will help with that. I mean, for my way, when I talk to funders out there with some of my work that I'm doing, I'm trying to get them to figure that we not just numbers and, and, and quantifying things, but we really, really need to know what the values of the community are so that they're developing their, so that we're developing impact and they're able to continue on. And so, you know, this is kind of some of the stuff I'm doing. So how am I going to do this? So Indigenous Ways of Knowing Present and Future Collaboration. So this is, a, this is a couple of my collaborations I got going on right now. This is one with Arcasante with the field right here. This is a recent collaboration that I did to try to grow out our varieties because we're having trouble in the drought to raise our traditional seeds, which are very important. And this one excites me the most because pretty soon I've, we're going to sign an agreement with the National Park Service to have a traditional demonstration of native science at Mesa Verde National Park which happens to be the home to the Hopi people. And so it's gonna be good to take our, take our corn home. You know, our corn has to have a house to live in too. <laughs> and so um, that's about it. Thank you very much. All right, hello everyone. My name is Hallie Hughes. I am an undergraduate here. Oh, and there are my slides. I never knew I was creatively starving until I had the opportunity to write and tell stories. So I'm deeply honored and excited to be here with you all today, engaging in humanity's oldest pastime, telling stories. I look around and I see the faces of people who, and peers and mentors who have been deeply impactful in my journey through my undergraduate degrees. And this building houses AIR, which is an institute that has changed the course of my life. Whenever I say I work for AIR, people always question the acronym and ask, well, what is resiliency? And I think I give a different answer every single time because I think about it a lot. Is resilience like a quantity? Is it a glass that we fill and empty? Does resilience act more like a fabric, something we can weave to be thicker or at times risk stretching too thin? Is it a quality, something a human can gain or lose, or is it simply an idea? And I think questioning resilience is funny as a young person. I know each generation has had their shared generational plights and planet shaking events. I don't really care to rank them. I like using humor to help process them. But I do think a person born in the 2000s takes the cake on having to be the most resilient, the fastest. This generation has been deeply altered by the pandemic, something we've had to endure throughout our entire higher education when we were not only earning a degree, we were learning how to navigate a true global crisis. We were learning how to mourn, we were learning how to advocate for science in a world that suddenly became very deeply distrustful of it. And within all of that, finding a way to reorient and refocus to come to class every day and earn our degrees. I will be forever marked as one of the few people to earn their degree during the global pandemic. And I take that as a mark of pride, as well as a wound, because I know the pandemic has taken away things from all of us, but I don't think it's all bad. I've never seen such resiliency, grit, and empathy as I do when I talk to people, young people, who have had this shared lived experience with me. This is a picture I took in Saguaro National Park in the heart of the pandemic, when the human world was seemingly crumbling around us, the natural world showed us to have hope and resilience, that the desert can be green with just a little bit of rain. Resilience has come to the modern discourse with a wide range of definitions. As a natural resource student and a proud ecologist, it's always come with the phrase ability to return to a reference state. But that actively confuses me because I don't know what state we're referring to. How far back on the world timeline do we have to go to find a suitable reference state? Maybe a couple thousand years ago, maybe way before human influence, like way, 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 way before. Well, maybe not that far, but I certainly don't have an idea. 
are our personal reference, right? I was born 250 years into the Industrial Revolution when CO2 levels were already accelerating. I was born in a post 9-11 world. My childhood was marked by the 2008 Great Recession. My high school years were marked by a political divide so intense people compared it to the Civil War. And now my college years were coupled with a pandemic. So as you can see, when every year and year and year becomes more unprecedented, you yearn for the precedented times. For these reasons, my view of resiliency doesn't have a reference state. In fact, I don't think we need them anymore. Instead of being obligated to try to mimic the past, I think we are instead demanded to look forward into the future. We, the practitioners, believers, researchers, and participants in resiliency get to decide what it looks like. Maybe it can be about expanding humanity's capacity, enduring adversity, or simply changing perspectives to look for the good. I choose to look for the good. And I don't think that's naive or dismissive. I think it's strategic and necessary. It's something we can do to navigate crisis. Humans were not born, we did not create stories, we were born into stories. So let's make ours resilient like our planet. Thank you. All right, I'm Mackenzie Waller. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an assistant professor. Um, I'm a landscape architect, and I'm also trained as an architect. The central thread of my work throughout my career is community co-development and design to address spatial and environmental injustices. And I look around in this space, and we have so much know-how, so much knowledge. Too much of it simply isn't applied to issues out there. And I wonder, what can we do about it? So I've been studying how stories, thank you for speakers before me, um, how stories and play can be used to overcome cognitive dis dissonance or resistance to resilience. I see these images are evoking some emotions and emotions are key for how we make decisions. Meanwhile, our methods of communicating knowledge and driving impact based on research has not kept pace. In my work, when we use stories and play as part of community conversations, we get better information from a more diverse set of stakeholders. Here, community members wrote goals on balloons and selected favorite stories about their neighborhood. Research supports this as well. The drive to play is as fundamental as our drives for food and sleep. Neuroscientists have identified seven primary emotions we are born with. Seeking, rage, fear, lust, care, panic, and play. Of those seven, play is the emotion that can best support overcoming resistance. Resistance is a response to messages that run counter to an individual's beliefs or opinion. And you may be experiencing it right now. It can show up as inertia, avoidance, fear, suspicion, perceived invulnerability, and reactance. This is happening in research as well. Dr. Michael Cove studies the Key Largo wood rat. This gives him a high resistance battle when communicating the value of this critical and endangered ecosystem engineer because of the stories we tell about rats. To shift the conversation, the team told a story about the wood rat's love for interior decorating. They hosted an event where folks could paint sticks to place out in the forest. In their research, Cove Labs found that wood rats preferentially select painted sticks when building their nests. Who can be afraid of an interior designer? This beer is a collaboration between First Magnitude Brewing and Dr. Jarrett Daniels. Dr. Daniels researches the endangered frosted elfin butterfly. The beer itself is brewed with yeast harvested from the butterfly. 
The project works at multiple scales to expand the range of the audience. And he uses a staged approach to engage community. He starts with beer to butterfly, opening the door for conversations on a whole host of native insects. This leads towards conversations around biodiversity con conservation and hyper-local tactics for action. The Duwamish River in Seattle is so polluted, it is host to multiple EPA Superfund sites, a national program for the nation's most contaminated places. We removed a letter to create Superfund Superfund using art to share research on the ecosystem health of the river. Oversized remote controlled word boats were like floating refrigerator magnets that participants could drive with remote controls. They could create all kinds of good and bad words like clean up or unclean. This underscored the complexity and uncertainty knowing its removal minimizes public agency. This logic model of the adaptive cycle <laughs> has both a slow incremental phase of growth and accumulation, and we often feel very safe there in research. And it has a rapid back loop of reorganization and renewal. Resilience engages in the full cycle. Tools like stories, play, arts, humanities can help us bring the public along for the ride on the back loop with us. I believe our resilience will hinge upon the ways we co-create moments of play, multiplicity of narrative, and joy in our cities, in our work, and in our lives. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Tiani Collins and I'm going to be talking about um, resilience in, in the arts and resilience in artists. And I, my title, oops, yeah, oh no, that's right, sorry. My title is um, diverse, Student Diversity Program Specialist for the Arts. And what that means is that my main job, first of all, is to support students and I do that in a variety of different ways. First, I'm a direct resource for students learning how to navigate the university system within the College of Fine Arts. And I do that in all kinds of different ways. Most prominently, I'm teaching them how to adult and all of that, what that means, how to talk to people, how to talk to professors, how to get themselves organized, and all of the other things that come with adulting. And if you deal with students, particularly undergrad, you know what I'm talking about. My other role is that I'm the creator of the Invisibility Salon. And th which is a student focused group that creates artistic space for students from historically excluded and marginalized backgrounds within the visual and performing arts. And we encourage students to share their voices, experiences and work. We not only give these emergent students an outlet for their expression and a chance to be seen and heard, but we are also creating a network and community where they can support and inspire each other in their journey to becoming their best selves. So the two concepts that I focus on that are resilience related are the idea of creating community and agency. Our logo represents the idea of foregrounding the voices of those who have been made to feel ignored in mainstream culture, hence the capitalization of the V and the minimization, minimization of the I and the N in the word invisibility. This logo was created by a student within the School of Art, and this is our main logo of the, um, of the 2D program in the School of Art. It encompasses, it encompasses representation from all, fours, all the, the four schools within the College of Fine Arts. So we have the School of Theater, Film, and Television, the, the Fred Fox School of Music, the School of Dance, and the School of Art all represented and all working together. As, as people who work here, you know that there are a lot of, I've been here about a year and a half, and the, the term silos comes up quite frequently that people aren't working together. So part of my goal is to have all of the schools within the College of Fine Arts working together. Salon stands for Student Artist Live Opportunity Night. The name Salon alludes to the fancy 16th century European salons of artistic gatherings of the elite. So we're doing the same kind of thing, but without all the pretension that surrounds it. 
Um, we are gathering to discuss and create art in all forms and helping students to develop their artistic voices and again, build community. We help students to, to learn agency, how not only to carve out safe spaces for themselves, but places to be able to push boundaries and not be afraid to fail big or succeed because that's how you learn and this is a, supposed to be the place in which you do that. And they also have to learn how to do all the things that go on behind the scenes in order to create these safe spaces. So they're learning how to, um, because it would be great to show up as an artist and just be able to do your thing, but we all know, well at least I know, that's not how it works in the real world unless you have a patron that's, and all of you researchers know that you can't do anything without funding. <laughs> so they are, the students that produce the salon are involved in every phase from the planning, the advertising, the recruitment, everything, they do it all. So they are learning how to produce their own work because if there's no one that's doing it for you, you have to do that yourself. Salon came apart, came about as partially, um, a result of my own experiences as being a first generation student of color within the arts. We are already few and far between. There are many spaces that I have walked in and classroom spaces particularly where I was lonely and isolated in a supposed learning environment because I was not included, reflected, or represented. And frequently I was reminded that these, I was reminded of these things in both direct and indirect ways. In grad school, I had a professor who would refer to me as a directress because men are directors. <laughs> in 2002, I became the first person, the first non-white person to graduate for, with an MFA in theater from the institution that I attended. With almost 100 years in as a school, I was the absolute first, which I found shocking. So you can imagine what my classrooms look like and what the spaces look like. So this is why I decided to get this going and organize within here. Our second annual salon is happening this year on March 30th from 5 to 7 p.m. The location is still to be announced, but if you want details, just contact me. Um, our first event, oops, sorry, I have another slide. <laughs> our first event uh, was a huge success with contributions from 32 students from the College of Fine Arts. It was an evening encompassing both completed works as well as works in progress, because it's an opportunity for students to not only share themselves, but to get feedback from people who will hold space for them to help them grow as an artist. And we invite you to become part of our network um, of support. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about it, you're free to contact me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Up until recently, blue plastic tarps did not really mean that much to me. But for folks living on the Gulf Coast, blue tarps on homes are a constant reminder of the ongoing disaster recovery following hurricanes. As we can see in this photo of a tarp that's on a roof that's draped kind of haphazardly, one could suspect that it's been there for quite a while. My name is Hannah Friedrich, and I'm a PhD student in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment. As a geographer, I'm really interested in the inequalities of disasters and recovery, specifically how disparities in recovery affect people in different groups across space and time. One such site of long -going, ongoing uh, recovery is Lake Charles. It's located 30 miles inland in southwest Louisiana, and it was the site of four federally declared disasters that happened within the span of 10 months. Two back-to-back -back hurricanes in fall of 2020, Hurricanes Laura and Delta, and a major uh, flooding event and a winter storm in early 2021. Following both of these events, specifically the two hurricanes, blue tarps are installed on homes. This is meant to prohibit further water damage after the events happen, and can be seen to this day across the city of Lake Charles. In fact, these blue tarps are so striking that they can even be seen from space, as seen in this satellite image that was taken over Lake Charles in November of 2020, a couple months after the two hurricanes. 
What this photo shows is that for each little grouping of blue pixels that you see on the screen is a single individual house that has a blue tarp on it. It tells us how dense blue tarps can be in a particular neighborhood, and given the timestamp of when the image was taken, how long recovery can last after these extreme events. I use satellite imagery like this in my research to deconstruct narratives of recovery through time. In this time series of imagery, we can see an image from October 2020, so shortly after Hurricane Delta, where there's a number of homes that have tarps on them. Fast forward to April 2021, some tarps have been taken off, but some, some are still there. And if we look in November 2022, most of the tarps are gone, but there's still a few tarps remaining. What this tells us is that recovery is happening, but it's not equal for everybody. In this conceptualization, I define resilience as a tarp that's been removed fairly quickly or in a timely manner. But the reality of recovery is very different on the ground. I partner with two separate community groups um, that are on the front lines of disaster recovery in Louisiana. The first is the Disaster Justice Network that uh, educates the public on resilient rebuilding techniques in their community. So they teach people how to fortify their roofs and use pretty cheap materials to fortify their roofs in their rebuilding process. The other group is the Louisiana Just Recovery Network that is pioneering innovative ways of using recycled materials like billboards to tarp their homes and get people back into their homes um, as quickly as possible. But it's not really for me to define what resilience means for these communities. I wanna end with this yard sign, a picture that I took of this yard sign um, in Louisiana that says, we will rise again. Most people ask from the outside, why wouldn't people just move or why are they rebuilding in place? Um, but people really wanna stay, this is their home. And so um, community led kind of definitions of, of resilience is really what is a guiding principle in my work. So both the community groups that I'm working with are really looking towards what residents are defining for resilience for themselves. Even if that means staying in, staying in place um, that is inevitably going to experience another devastating hurricane in the future and using resilient rebuilding techniques uh, to rebuild. So in this way, communities are defining for themselves what resilience is. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the segue. That was wonderful. Uh, I'm going to talk about a conceptualization of resilience, but within the context of the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh. And I'm going to be talking about community definitions of resilience and going perhaps beyond resilience. So for those of you who are just who may not know, the Rohingya refugee crisis uh, is something that's happened after 2017. But it, it's important to know that before 2017, the Rohingya were known as the most persecuted minority around the globe. And then a genocide happened to them, an ethnic cleansing. So they were being treated pretty poorly to begin with. And then 2017, they are the victims of genocide. On the left is a satellite image of a village uh, in October, or sorry, in early 2017, and then one in late 2017, and the village is completely gone. On the right is the picture of the refugees crossing the river between Bangladesh and Myanmar, and then the picture of the camp. It is the world's largest refugee camp and probably the world's largest ever. There's approximately 1.1 million people, 700,000 of them fled in 2017, okay? Tragedy, right? Tragedy. I've been working with a group called Art Illusion for the last three years. Art Illusion does artwork in the camps. They also work with refugees in four other countries. Uh, these are participatory art projects, mostly murals. There's now over 300 murals in the Rohingya refugee camps painted by Rohingya artists. When they went in they, and said, we want to work with Rohingya artists, people said there is no such thing as a Rohingya artist. 
They went and found people who had been persecuted so much that they weren't able to practice their art in Myanmar. And then they were able to train, work with them, and paint these murals. Oftentimes, they're done with children. And we were called in and working with them to measure what is the effect of these uh, participatory art projects. How does it affect resilience? How does it affect growth? And we wanted to do community-based participatory action research where we wanted the community to take control of the research project. So we were teaching research methods to the Rohingya artists and they ate it up. They, you can see pictures of, um, let's go back. Uh, you can see picture on the left, this is actually Rohingya artists uh, interviewing each other and then also interviewing children who were doing the art projects. We taught them how to use tablets, how to use Kobo toolbox, how to use, uh, do simple data analysis. Uh, they control the whole project. They can do the surveys anytime they want. They can ask questions. They can define resilience, define post-traumatic growth. From that context, I wanna have three provocations to think about resilience and maybe think beyond resilience. First of all, on the psychosocial level, we have something that's called resilience, which is bouncing back, as many people said, going back to a prior state. Is there a possibility of going beyond the prior state? Is there a possibility for growth, transformation? In psychology, we call it post-traumatic growth. Um, I, on the bottom, you'll see um, a woman named Ayala Akhtar. She was victimized horribly in the genocide of 2017. She is now an artist for the Rohingya, a Rohingya artist. Um, we, um, she is an amazing person to talk to. She can talk about her tragedy, about how she survived the genocide, how she lost most of her family, but then she'll talk about hope, dreams, etc. And she was, uh, when my colleagues were um, organizing an event at the Dhaka um, Literary Festival a couple months ago, they said, we want to bring a Rohingya artist, we want to bring a woman, and they said a Rohingya artist will never come and she'll be too shy to talk. I laughed when I heard that because I've talked to Ayala. Ayala, Ayala is not afraid to talk and Ayala was the star of the show. Okay. Second, provocation two, systems level. What if the system we want to return to is actually the oppression? What if the system is not going, to, for the Rohingya to go back to where they were, is not an, a possibility. For them to go back to where they are in the refugee camp, that's not a possibility. We talk about um, them um, in resilience work, we talk about uh, becoming small uh, uh, business owners. This is a day on the top left when hundreds of Rohingya shops were bulldozed overnight by the, by the government. The picture on the bottom is a Rohingya art village that the Rohingya wanted to create. It was bulldozed. Okay. Provocation three. I, when I hear resilience in international development work and I hear it everywhere in international development work, it reminds me of when I heard particip participation as the panacea for development and I get worried. And just like we need to radically reflect on participation from 20 years ago, we need to radically reflect on uh, resilience. And having said that, we can start talking about transformation as separate from resilience or within resilience, we can talk about maybe steps of resilience, which go to maybe something that is transformative, takes into account post-traumatic growth, takes into account that we don't want resilience back to oppressive systems, but that we want to change the system as well. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was amazing, uh, exceeded my wildest dreams. So thank all of the speakers, um, just, just terrific talks. All right, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for this afternoon. We have Dave Brashears, Sabrina Helm, and Greg Baron Gafford. 
Caitlin Hall uh, was unable to join us at the last minute this afternoon. So thank you all for being here. Um, Dave's going to moderate our panel and will introduce our panelists and also offer his own perspectives. So these panelists have listened to our speakers and they've been asked to, as it says up here on the slide, to synthesize key themes that they've heard, to note maybe some surprises, um, some things that surprise them, and offer their insights based on what has emerged for them um, during this first round of talks. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave and um, he'll introduce our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's great. It's been a great session so far. And uh, this is one reason I really enjoy being at University of Arizona is that environment is so broad here. And there are so many different activities going on. Um, so on our panel today is Sabrina Helm and Greg Baron Gafford. Sabrina is an associate professor for retailing and uh, consumer science. Her scholarly background is in marketing and management, but she also has a strong passion for the natural environment, which has impacted her research work. Currently, she studies mental health effects of climate change, how we teach about climate change, and how climate change affects people's decisions, such as having children or planning for retirement. She also studies resilience, specifically consumer resilience in the context of changes brought about upon cli by climate change. And she's a member of the Faculty Advisory of AIR and an advocate for sustainability and climate action in our institution. Uh, Greg is a professor in the School of Geography and Development and B2 Earth Science at Biosphere 2, and he's also associate director for the UA Community and School Garden Program. He's a biogeographer studying how semi-arid plants and ecosystems respond to threats from drought, climate change, and human pressures like overgrazing or clearing for renewable energy production. For the last decade, he's been working on the field of agrovoltaics, the concept of co-locating agriculture with renewable energy generating solar panels. So with that, um, I'd like to just ask uh, Sabrina and then Greg to, to comment on um, sort of their own perspectives from, from their lens of resilience and then sort of some general uh, insights that they might have from the talks that we've heard so far from the very diverse set of perspectives. So Sabrina. Thank you and thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me um, to today's event. We have now had several iterations thinking about how we relate to, to resilience. So I have an advantage here because we could practice a little bit. So I appreciate that very much. Um, from my perspective, um, resilience um, indeed means what we heard several times here to bounce forward to a better state. Bouncing forward and not bouncing backward to a, to a, to a better state. Um, and if I think about resilience, from my background, it is typically, as, as Dave already highlighted, it's from the perspective of us as individual consumers, people going about our everyday lives. What does that mean? What does resilience mean in that context? It's also something we heard several times um, uh, referred here al already. Um, and I like, I don't like to, but I think back to the beginning of the, of the COVID pandemic as an example, for instance, of how we acted and how we learned to adapt and how fast we were in certain manners in, in terms of adapting to changes and some things we could never really adapt to. And um, overall, we've seen a lot of movement in how we as humans showed resilience in such a quite noteworthy event, which most people probably thought was quite, quite negatively impacting our lives. And then we also heard about there were many lessons learned and there were many things that we can build on towards the future. And then I think about climate change, which is sort of like the overarching topic I think about when I think about the need for resilience. There will be a lot of extreme changes for people in the coming years and decades. And um, how are we preparing for that? We are not even prepared in our pantries to have a couple of days no grocery shopping, as we noticed in the, in the COVID pandemic in the early days. How are we going to cope with much bigger kind of crisis? So um, that, that's sort of like how, how I look at resilience. That's my interest in resilience. And that's, that, that's what I uh, saw shining through a couple of the topics here as well. Um, we had been asked to synthesize that that's kind of in the, in, in the kind of moment that we had here, quite, quite difficult. But that's one of the aspects that I really see, is that understanding that we are able to plan towards a better future, 
and that resilience requires that, that planning. We heard about microbes, right? How microbes can also, you know, bounce back. But I thought about, well, actually, that's a good news because I felt we're smarter than microbes in that respect. We can plan for the place where we want to be. And it can be a different place and a better place. And we have heard sometimes the systems that we had. They are not the ones that we should try to bounce back to. So we need to plan and we need to build towards a better place. And, and so that, that was one of the very important common themes that I, that I saw here, here and that you know, really inspires me to think about more. Great, thank Great. you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. Can you hear me okay? Shall I hold it? No? Thanks. Oh, it's because it, it slipped down. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, and thanks for having us up here. I lamented with Sharon that this is a, a challenge to be at the front of this audience. It's not a, a role that I'm used to. And I find it especially challenging given who's in this room and likely online in terms of what the university um, attracts in terms of drivers of thinking about resilience. Um, I'm a physical scientist, as Dave mentioned. And so when I've thought about resilience historically, it's been for my entire professional education, thinking about right on this horizon is this pending change. And over the last 20 years has been gradually more and more experiencing those perturbations that happen, you know, occasionally and then quarterly and then regularly and trying to think about what what kind of systems we can try to build into place so that we are able to bounce back more quickly. And holy cow, listening to Haley talk about so poetically about, you know, do we need to return to a reference point and what reference point? And maybe we don't need them anymore. Um, that insight that comes from living in the 2000s. I, I often joke about what it means to be so young and so worried until recently, um, side story, one of my students in a class recently said, um, we we're talking about remote sensing. And she said, you know, in my generation, we have all of these tools. It's not like when you were studying back in the 1900s. <laughs> she wasn't wrong, but you don't have to say it that way. <laughs> and so to think about what this generation that's growing up um, in the educational system right now and, and the potential they have is really exciting. Some uh, themes that, that stood out to me because I did academically grow up here at the university and had the privilege of knowing Dave 20 years ago or so um, and working with Alan from the arts is thinking about that what we saw this, uh, this first set of talks is how meaningful visual arts um, can be in terms of conveying um, the importance of visuals, whether they're remote sensing images as um, Hannah was sharing or the graphs that um, Ellen mentioned that mimic some of our riverways or the acknowledgement of visual and textile arts. But Ellen challenged me to think about arts beyond being just a tool, but the research that we need to do on how well arts can be a mechanism for communicating and, and doing um, a new form of listening. I think listening was another um, term that kept coming up to me is how can we think about new ways of um, acquiring knowledge? Who are those uh, formerly or sometimes still invisible voices that we're not hearing from? I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Um, I'll just share a couple of perspectives of my own. So I'm an ecologist. I think about uh, climate change and how systems respond to climate change. And um, in that context, we think often about resilience, like sort of through the national park perspective of national parks are, you know, sort of mandated with trying to maintain systems in the, in the same state they've been. And so we'd like to be resilient in that context and sort of maintain them as much as we can. But a lot of the new thinking is, is focused on how do we, uh, what are the options when we can't do that under really extreme climate change? And so two of the options, one of them is sort of let things go and move forward. And that may have to happen in, in many contexts, 
But an important intermediate uh, situation that we're going to be thinking about a lot is how do we guide systems through transition to make sort of the best transition that we can, given that we can't always sort of get things to spring back in place or, or be resilient in that particular definition of resilience. So that's a little bit about uh, my perspective of resilience is thinking about not only how do we try to maintain systems in their current state, but also uh, as they get pushed over, how do we guide transition when we can't necessarily keep things in the same state that they've been. Um, some themes that I saw, um, uh, and there was a lot of fantastic information, a lot of different perspectives. Um, as a scientist, it first made me think about, you know, there's a lot of important scientific frontiers uh, that we still need to address, and, and the plant microbes example was, was great in terms of that. Um, second, that, that we need to address uh, resilience, that there's a lot of important ways in terms of interacting and communicating, in addition to these Western science perspectives. Uh, ways of knowing uh, from indigenous perspectives, art, science, economics, storytelling. Uh, so really diverse, important ways to, to be thinking about uh, moving ahead and trying to address the problems that we have as a society. Um, and then I thought another important theme was, was thinking about, um, this came up in, in Derek's talk, but thinking about cross-cutting non-obvious ways, uh, non-obvious effects when designing policy. So different particular challenges uh, that, that happen. So we, we're trying to figure out how do we anticipate more surprises and figure out how to better manage in that context. Um, so one of the other th points that came up was thinking about um, different types of collaboration and different siloing that has been occurring uh, among all these different topics of resilience. And so Sabrina and Greg, I'm wondering if you could talk about that, either any experience about thinking about um, how to collaborate in a context of resilience or silos that you've encountered in, in the context of resilience. Well, I mean, we are, we, are, we are all here already collaborating in the context of resilience. And um, that's, that's also how I have experienced it. When I started getting into you know, thinking more about resilience as a topic from my particular perspective, I immediately see there, there is no research on consumer resilience. It doesn't exist. It's absolutely non, not a topic. So I have to go elsewhere. So I have to adopt the perspectives from psychology and from entirely different context because there is no pathway for me here to follow. I have no chance but to try and go into the other silos and uh, try and find colleagues who are more knowledgeable on, on the concept in, of itself in order then to, to better understand what it means in my particular context. So I think if we, if we look at resilience from the perspective of individual people's resilience, then um, uh, I believe we, we have already a pretty good common ground in the social sciences that we can build on, even if we are advancing in rather novel fields, um, as it may be in my particular case for consumer um, um, resilience, or also in terms of individual, well, resiliency if it comes to climate change. Um, from my perspective, again, psychological resiliency, but then there's many other forms in which we can look at uh, uh, resiliency here. And we run into the typical shortcomings and problems that our discipline and our academic work and scholarly work brings with it in, in terms of where do I even find the information? How can I convince you know, colleagues to participate in a research endeavor that's not originally theirs? Are they, uh, do I have enough people who are motivated and bold enough to go into a new field? Um, and I, I may, maybe one story that I may, may also relate to, I for personal reasons became very interested in the topic of how climate change worries um, affect people's decision to have children, uh, which for particularly younger people is probably fairly, well, logical consequence of, of thinking about the future. Yeah. Um, and I, I couldn't find colleagues who could and would work on that topic with me. Um, although there are so many more knowledgeable people in those specific areas, but, but 
it's it's just this scholarly lag yeah or scholarly drag because we have so many projects we're already running so fast we can't put no, no, new stuff into our our very busy schedule um and now here comes this new topic and i can't engage in it there's just so many many uh, restrictions so there's 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 silos yes but there's 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 also um not there's no leeway in the way we work to allow for new topics to be you know pulled up and um, that's that's one of the shortcomings that i see and that i'm a little bit worried about then if you have to be quicker with with um trying to help in a painful transition that's going to come for pretty much all of us how can we get more people on board to be part of the journey if that means they have to leave behind some of of the other work of the other topic i'm just purely talking about the research community at this point well thanks um in our my own research of thinking about resilience and this idea of agrivoltaics this food and energy co-location i thought i was dealing with a, a very obvious topic in that people needed food they needed renewable energy they didn't want to have to make this decision of either or and we saw them waves that it could um, help with water retention. But it wasn't until we started to talk about some of our early findings that I realized just how much of a silo I was still in. Um, and one of those benefits of being around the university a while is I've been able to um, think about ways that the university has invested in connections to community. Um, and that really showed up when Ellen and some others were challenging us to think about how knowledge is gained and shared. Um, understanding um, Sharon's point at the beginning of that, that recognition statement of all sources of knowledge are valued. Thankfully, the university is invested in the Indigenous uh, Resource Center as a mechanism for not trying to take solutions out to communities, including rural and Indigenous communities, but to be embedded with folks in those communities that can help us listen better. I think about all the extension agents and uh, extension officers who have been building relationships with farmers and practitioners for decades that um, not only enable us to take some of our research um, off the campus and out there, but also listen to hear about what are some of the challenges that they want studied. Um, I think part of what I'm really trying to, to drive my own group to do is build a foundation of listening through some of these extension offices and listening sessions with community members, um, incorporating those multiple ways of knowing and moving beyond um, the way I started was National Science Foundation funding opportunities that a lot of times were around foundational or basic research and migrating into a space of more solution driven research. Um, that as Michael said is value based and value driven um, and someone else described it as community defined I think it was Hannah um, those and if you see if you sit back and listen to that statement you hear a lot of drivers from the community outside of the walls of our campus and so I think for me the biggest silo isn't talking to a hydrologist or an economist anymore. It's driving me to think about ways to incorporate connection with community. Yeah, I think that that uh, communication challenge is so is so big. A couple of ways um, that that I've been involved in collaboration and different activities. Uh, I've worked with with Ellen McMahon, who kicked off the session today, in terms of uh, art and environment activities. And uh, this was a fantastic way uh, to share our different insights and perspectives. And Ellen came up with some fantastic art projects that uh, helped communicate uh, things about large scale tree die off and the impacts of that in ways that that, you know, you can never communicate with with your geeky sort of peer reviewed scientific publications. So that was a really fantastic way of thinking about increasing sort of collaboration. Uh, ways of knowing and trying to communicate uh, in a collaborative way and working together. Uh, I have a current project where we're, we're asking things about if there's lots of, lots of large scale tree die off in one place, will that affect the climate enough that it could affect somewhere else? 
And now we're working with collaboratively with some economists trying to calculate if there's an economic impact on agriculture elsewhere. And so that's a whole new language for me too, trying to, trying to figure out how to collaborate in that way. So those have, those have been uh, some examples of trying to move beyond silos and increase communication related to resilience in a, in a variety of ways. Dave, Dave, can I say so? one, yes, one more please. thing? Because you, you, you said the silo is, is just not internally the different you know, disciplines and so forth. The silo is to the, towards the outside. And I, oh. I would like to encourage um, um, everybody who's working on the topic to make use of our fantastic to team in communications and get you know, your work into the media and talk to the public about that. Talk about you know, research activities going on here and the opportunities that are here in, in terms of engaging with, with, with research and with science. Yeah, because it's, it's been super effective and this is for me a great shout out <laughs> um, uh, to the team that, that they do an excellent job in, in getting us into the media world and, and garnering interest for the work that's going on here. Yeah, I think that's that's another really important and challenging and scary way to interact. But trying to figure out how to interact with the media and, and convey your your message and the and the information that you have um, to a broader audience, and that's been that's been a part of our effort as well uh, as we've been moving ahead on tree die off issues. Um, McKinsey highlighted, um, you know, not enough information is applied to solve problems, and I wonder if you could comment on that, thinking about um how to how to move forward in that direction or the challenges posed relative to that to not enough information is applied to solve problems well i can start this time Sabrina. <laughs> forcing you to go first every time um i think that's exactly what i was uh, getting at dave is connecting the people who we ultimately want to work with to implement solutions um to not only be hearing from them directly um, in terms of what they see some of the challenges are, but how do we convey, um, is that what you're asking us, how we can convey some of that information? Sure. Um, I've been inspired by people who um, have already spoken, including Laura, who at one point had posters all over her office um, with ways that she worked with some of the art students to convey science. Um, so I, I wish we, there's an opportunity to pass the mic and say, as we're meeting everybody and hearing things, Laura, how did you do that? And maybe Laura can wave and I'll sign, I'll suggest people come ask you um, how you're able to do that. Looking past the, the faculty that are in the room who helped drive some of these initiatives to remember that we have all of these um, student groups that can do that. Um, another guy who's really great um, from Biosphere 2 is uh, Aaron Bouget, who is in here today, but has gotten some air support um, called uh, Science in Motion, another way of um, doing electronic illustration of not only science finding, but the, the reasons behind we're asking some of these scientific questions that's been really, really effective, um, mind-blowingly effective. Great. Well, I mean, if we look at, at information, we, we, we don't have all the information we need, obviously, to, to come to good conclusions yet of what the resilient or what the future may look like past past the, uh, the next couple um, of, of, of years if you look at, for instance, topics such as climate change. Um, but it may also sometimes be that we have too much information that has been already conveyed and misinterpreted and there's a lot, as we know, all and suffer from misinformation going on. Yeah, so addressing that more in the in the communications with the with the public remains one of our big big issues, our big um, our big challenges. Yeah, uh, you you uh, reference, referenced um, Mackenzie's talk. She she said bring the public um, for the right. Yeah, for the for the science right, if you will. Um, but who who of the public is that? Yeah, and what what to do about those in the public that are not in for that right? Yeah, and definitely want quite different right. Um, those those certainly um, remain issues, particularly in, in 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 this country. And I know colleagues working on that as well. Um, super important in this context because again, if I look at topics such as the one I'm working on, where, where, where we're looking at pretty much everybody and everybody's need for adapting toward the future, that is going to be highly barricaded in its effectiveness if you know people are not in for the ride. 
Let's add to that one other idea that I was thinking about is not an idea, just something I've realized exists in the social sciences is community engaged research. A lot of times in the physical sciences, we've talked about citizen scientists where they help us in a lot of almost one off ways. Um, you know, they might collect data at one point in time and and it's meaningful because it is part of a bigger portfolio of research but that community engaged research is a is a next level and i won't do it in justice by describing it more but I encourage you to look it up and and know that there are people at the university who are who are actively doing um, this kind of work which is a citizen science on steroids for example i was at a a community hearing around a solar project um, where we were talking about the potential of retaining agriculture and they said you know you work at the university you probably collect the samples and then do something to them on the way back you know and it was like wow okay so you're really not going to trust us and coming back to how do you build trust um, is more about welcoming people in and some of that is doing diverse recruiting um, to draw in more students from the rural places where these issues are hitting the road, um, recruiting indigenous students is, um, who are doing that same situation, bringing that knowledge and ways back. Yeah, I think um, the, the whole idea of co-production of knowledge and trying to work together more collaboratively to move, to move ahead and solve problems. I know there's lots of experts in this room that are focused on that. I think that's a key approach that um, we need to integrate more in terms of how we move forward. Um, I want to return back to um, the idea of resilience. Um, Allie had a whole bunch of, of nice ideas about this. Is it a quantity, a fabric, a quality, an idea? Um, is it the ability to return to a reference state? Uh, and instead of looking at the past, are we obligated to look to the future? I'm wondering kind of if you can talk about sort of in, in addressing resilience, um, thinking about this, the, the, the changing environment that we have and what challenges you see in your particular area of trying to uh, develop a more um, effective approach to resilience and the barriers that you, that you see in, the, in that direction. Um, yeah, I think about that all day. <laughs> um, and and uh, Michael, you, you you said um, you said something that I wanted to reference there. There two values are or I paraphrase, yeah, but values are the bedrock of resilience. Values. So if I look at what kinds of values we hold, um, um, you talked about specific cultural values. Um, if I look at the way I look at culture, when I look from my field, I see consumer culture. Yeah, and that's a very manifest um, issue, in particularly if we think about you know, climate change and, and overconsumption being the main driver. Um, so I, I think about that all day long because it requires profound changes in lifestyle for everybody involved um, in order to even make a dent, right? Particular groups more so than others, as we know carbon impact is certainly not evenly distributed in any society. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, I wonder, I often wonder um, how, how we can basically make the necessary changes palatable enough for consumers to actually try. That's why I referenced the COVID-19 scenario, because then we were forced. And we saw if we are forced, we can change quite a lot. And in all honesty, I mean, there was a lot of stress, all that, but I'm just talking in terms of what resources were available in, ter in terms of, you know, tangible resources. And sometimes things were not available due to um, shortages and so forth. But we may do. I mean, we were not, most of us, I certainly, we, we didn't have to really cut back all that, all that much, although it was quite, quite a pronounced crisis scenario for all of us. Um, so what will it take? for people to really radically alter their everyday lifestyle. I mean, I teach consumer behavior, I teach sustainable consumption. I have you know, a lot of discussions with my students about what it might take in terms of changing transportation needs. You, know, you can't just Uber around all the time. <laughs> um, and and, and, and take, take vacation travel and all our customary kind of um, products and services that we use every day. Um, what does it take? to make you consider changing that. And although many of us are so concerned, 
the changes we individually make are, tend to be rather small. So that, that's, that's what I think about, that's what worries me, is, is really how, how we can make a big transition in lifestyles um, in the necessary time to, well, fulfill our obligation towards next generations. Great. Sure, and quickly I would just um, stick with your theme of value. I mean, when I saw Michael's slides ahead of time to build a little bit of a thought about what was coming, the value added resiliency. I think that point comes up time and again as we try to recruit the next generation of graduate students and in our undergraduate classes, we, we hear what they're most passionate about. It is about solutions driven work, which is related to their own value. We talk about this intersection of knowledge and practice um, and their own values. And I think we've seen, we've seen social science research that shows that a lot of our more invisible um, populations sign up for graduate programs because they are value-based. Um, and even more in the current generation, I think we're seeing those types of uh, projects. So I hope that we will continue to do that listening so that we can understand the values that will drive change on the ground. Again, coming back to our own agrivoltaics project, um, if we go listen to the, you have to go listen to the farmers and the ranchers who are experiencing these water challenges before you even try to consider resilient options. Yeah, and I also uh, appreciated uh, Michael's point on uh, what does what is our community value? How do we measure it? Thinking about integrating that type of information into moving forward. Um, obviously, this is a networking opportunity here at the university, uh, and thinking about resilience and and all the diverse perspectives that we have here in terms of resilience. I'm wondering if uh, you could comment on ideas about directions that you see University of Arizona could go in different ways to build more collaboration in the context of resilience, because I think that's that's a key theme for why we're here today. Well, Sharon, there's already so much going on, right? So <laughs> I can probably play that back to you pretty much um, of, of all the different opportunities we have, such as su such as these. Um, I sometimes wish I had something as simple as a bulletin board where I could just throw my idea and you know you would all receive it if you were so inclined to read my missive yeah but um, it, it it's still the the very fundamental exchange of initial ideas and interests remains such a befuddling difficult thing to do I mean right now we're sitting on here so if I have an idea I can explain it all to you you might listen and you say oh yeah I'm interested in that too but once you leave this room um, where is my where is my bulletin board to really just shout out? Is there anybody interested in this topic that I just developed, which is you know how does the fear of climate change affect people's retirement decisions? Look in the literature. There's nothing. It's exciting. Anybody? Any takers? So that that kind of I mean very simple, probably simplistic, but but that would be very helpful from my perspective. Well, I'll echo that. Um, we've talked, thankfully, you were a good listener as we've been talking about this theme um, and asking these questions. I think something like this, where we even shortened the five minutes to three so we could do this bulletin board. Um, a second one is the examples that have existed in AIR in its previous iterations, which were intentional cross-college um, funding opportunities. I mean, the only reason I know people from landscape architecture was because of initial air opportunities that said you have to go across speedway practically um, to think about collaborative projects for um, doing intersectional work and the last one is um, pitching an idea that ellen and greg uh, 3g um, and i talked about years ago which really felt underscored today catalyzing transdisciplinary research and learning by linking arts humanities social and environmental sciences again that initiative that is intentionally looking beyond the silos. Imagine if you also required us to have a community partner, how much more quickly some of these conversations would be catalyzed. Good, so we're almost out of time. Um, so uh, any key final insights or takeaway message from kind of what we've heard so far? I'm coming back to Mackenzie. Um, you were talking about co-creating 
um, or strategies for co-creating desired futures. Um, in my work, I work with a theory called um, the imagined futures and how our imagination of the future is uh, impacting our actual behavior today. And I think that is very useful in this context of plant resiliency, I guess, <laughs> planning for that place we would like to be instead of you know bouncing back to that state that we had before and so i i would that that's one of my my main encouragements from from um, listening to um, all of you is that this imagined future uh, um, is something that we can co-develop and that we can can certainly strategize about but that we can be part of that process of finding a suitable better future i really like that 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 perspective very well so theory of imagined futures very very cool um for me it's uh listening and doing uh, more work around listening leaning into those university resources around um, our extension officers who are out there listening um, constantly to what what the public is wondering about so that when we do our use inspired research um, it's towards that community purpose and again um, understanding just how much value um, is a driver for action among the public so i just uh, enjoyed hearing the really diverse set of perspectives again sort of ways of knowing from indigenous perspectives art science economics storytelling uh, i think that was really valuable and insightful I want to thank Sharon for organizing and for uh, allowing us to, to share our thoughts here. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Let's thank Dave, Greg, and Sabrina. We're going to go to um, our first talk for the second session. That is our last talk for the second session. So if you can go to the top. Um, it's Lad Keith. Yes. All right, I, my apologies. Um, we're going to just be adaptable and resilient and nimble here and um, move straight into our second set of five minute talks. I'll um, signal to you when you have about a minute left. Thanks. Talk about resilience, right? <laughs> thank you. All right, so thank you. My name is Lad Keith, and I'm an assistant professor of planning. And I literally work on heat resilience, but thank you, Sharon, for the opportunity to speak um, to my work. And uh, I appreciated the perspectives that have been shared so far, particularly the students. I really am, have enjoyed uh, hearing all of those perspectives, too. So heat, of course, as everyone in the room knows, is an increasing climate risk, but ironically, cities have planned uh, for other climate risks before heat, right? So we've done flood planning wildfire planning, drought planning, flood planning, uh, far before um, our efforts to deal with heat resilience. Um, as you see on the chart, um, of course, climate change is leading to gradual annual average temperature rises, um, which is kind of shown, there's a little clicker, maybe. So of course, these two differences, um, but that's leading also to those more record-breaking heat waves. Um, which is kind of over here in the tail end, right? And so as a society, we do a really good job of paying attention to these record-breaking events and uh, kind of focus our resilience attention towards that. We do a much worse job of uh, kind of recognizing the resilience that's required for those uh, slow average uh, gradual rises in temperature too, right? So that leads one question kind of broadly that's applicable outside of heat resilience is, what are we actually trying to be resilient to? And in many cases, we pay attention to those uh, acute events like those extreme heat events um, but we pay less attention to those uh, gradual chronic uh, resilience issues right um, that are often more systematic and kind of uh, have societal impacts as well let's see so another question is who are we being resilient for or who who is the target of the resilience right and so of course we know that the way that we've built cities um, has led certain parts of our cities due to the urban heat island effect to be hotter than their uh, counterparts, right? So marginalized communities, lower income communities um, often have less vegetation, have more impervious services and are much hotter than their richer and uh, whiter counterparts. A lot of this is due to things like historic land use practices like redlining that, are, that were racist. And although they are 
of course, illegal now. Um, those uh, temperature differentials are still in existence today and still kind of continue forward, right? And so we know that there's inequitable impacts of heat. And you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, just the difference between two uh, neighborhoods in Los Angeles and just the difference that that tree canopy can make. And we see those differences across uh, every city in the United States, including here in Tucson. And then of course the populations that are unhoused and that's a picture from San Antonio of just their, uh, of just a um, unhoused uh, tent, uh, which is, uh, where uh, one of those populations is living. But of course, public health impacts, quality of life, economic, energy and water use, kind of down the line, heat impacts a lot of our urban systems. <clears throat> and so in a book that we recently published, my co-author Sarah Miro and myself with the American Planning Association, we literally defined uh, heat resilience for the first time. And we defined it as proactively mitigating and managing urban heat across the many systems and sectors that it affects. And so we really wanted city decision makers to pay attention to those three contributors to heat. So climate change, urban heat island effect, and weather patterns. We really wanted them to think of that framework of those impacts across social, infrastructure, environmental, and economic um, impacts. And then thinking about those two uh, main heat resilient strategy categories, heat mitigation and heat management that I'll talk about. And now this is not working. Sorry. <laughs> Could you advance the next slide? So for those two, uh, for those two main categories, um, this is developed from literature reviews, surveys, and interviews that we've done with uh, decision makers across the United States. And really the, what the sun diagram is showing is heat mitigation on the top is really aimed at reducing that urban heat island effect that we can control as planners, as designers of the built environment, right? So that's through things like larger land use pattern changes, looking at specific urban designs, so the site design scale, looking at increasing urban greening, and then also looking at reducing waste heat from things like air conditioning and automobile usage. On the bottom is heat management strategies, so preparing and responding to the heat that we can't uh, mitigate in the built environment through things like thinking about energy systems, personal exposure, public health and emergency preparedness. The important thing here is the time scale, of course, between these different uh, these different strategies and the different effect, the different sectors that are all involved with these. So, planning, landscape architecture, architecture, civil engineers, public health, um, emergency managers, all of those are very important. Next slide. I guess I got that one. And um, to actually achieve that, we really need to think about heat governance. So just really quickly, we uh, published a comment piece in Nature where we defined heat governance as the actors, strategies, processes, and institutions that guide decision making for both mitigating and managing heat as a hazard. And again, going beyond just resilience as a goal, but how do we actually get there? What governance structures do need to be in place? In some cities like Phoenix, Miami-Dade County, and uh, Los Angeles, they were able to uh, actually create a chief heat officer position. In cities like Tucson, that's probably not possible due to our resources. And in smaller communities, that's certainly not possible. So what kind of governance structures at the state and federal level are really required um, for them to also achieve heat resilience? And finally, I'll just wrap up by saying um, the part that I'm really excited about is we do have ongoing uh, work here at the University of Arizona. Uh, where we're building our capacity essentially to address heat resilience across these different sectors and uh, scales. So we have a CDC BRACE project where we're looking at heat resilience in public health systems. Of course, CLEMAS was refunded um, where we're looking at heat resilience specifically now in rural tribal and borderland communities, which is a much underserved area because a lot of the focus on heat resilience has been on urban systems. Um, but the things that work for cities for heat resilience like planting more trees, doing uh, cool roadway projects, um, aren't really appropriate in rural areas, right? And so what kind of strategies are necessary in those rural areas? And then finally, we have a newly funded uh, $25 million Southwest Urban Corridor Integrated Field Laboratory that we're kicking off, um, where we're looking at heat at the regional scale for all of the, the Arizona Sun Corridor. So kind of excited to be part of these teams. And um, again, the University of Arizona is a really big player in this area and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the rest of the talks throughout the afternoon. Thank you.
Shora, Malaja, Ejin Machler, Shuk, Bazamalachia, B. Udishik, Dalan, Kong, B. Hukog, Chaba, Gadik. Hello, everyone. My name is Joy LaFrance. My Absalagan name is Ejin Machlish, which means fortunate with horses, and was given to me by Sue Takes Horse. I come from the Absalagan Nation in Montana, and I'm happy to be here talking a little bit about the work that I do. Um, Bimachba means medicine waters, and I think of the Little Bighorn River as the medicine waters, the sacred waters of my people. It's a staple of existence. And I'm happy to be talking to you a little bit about how I'm bridging traditional understandings and hydrologic science to protect the Little Bighorn River. So do raise your hand if you've heard of the Battle of Little Bighorn. Okay, that, <laughs> that the Battle of Little Bighorn happened right along the Little Bighorn River. So let's take ourselves to Montana where the 2.3 million acre Crow Reservation is located. This is my home. It is home to my people, the Absalagan Nation, and it's also home to the Bighorn Mountains. And we were brought to this land through the sacred tobacco seed, Ichichia. And uh, we've, we've been on this land for many, many generations. And we, as the Psalga people, we have been instructed on how to care for this land. For example, in the springtime, we say when the cotton first falls. We're actually not allowed to swim in the river until this event happens. And we go to the river in our finest clothing and bring our finest meats and we feed the river to show respect for Buluksa, the water creatures, because we know the power and might that water has. And we always want to make sure that we're showing our respect and gratitude, but also asking for protection while we're in the river. And for me, that's important because I study the Little Bighorn River and I'm in the river almost <laughs> all year round. And so as Apsalga people, we're a product of the land and our connection to it. Itchikbalia, first maker, he molded us into people using the mud from the deep waters. And that's a reminder that we come from the materials of the earth and the land itself. And so in this picture here, this is Bighorn Canyon. And we have a story there about Chilapsopo, the seven sacred rams. And we're instructed, we're told by the, the Chilapsopo that we must always keep the names of the Bighorn Mountains, the Bighorn River, and Little Bighorn River. As long as those names remain the same, we will always remain as Absalaga people. And to me, that really is just a reflection that, uh, to me, that just means that the river is really a reflection of us. So my research is specifically in the Little Bighorn River watershed. And we, this river is known as Izakh Burifja Ajagada. My people have been along this river for many, many generations. I grew up along this river, and my family still <laughs> lives along this river. So it's a very, very important watershed to us. And sorry, excuse me. And every time we, every time I do my research or I'm coming upon the river, there are protocols that I have to follow because, like I mentioned before, we're we're not supposed to be in these waters at certain times of the year, and I I follow. Um, our protocols and ensuring that I'm always, you know, making sure that I'm protected when I'm in the waters. Um, and so the Little Bighorn River, it begins in the Bighorn Mountains, the heart of Crow Country, or what I like to call my outside heart. And it really is in the full responsibility and care of Absalagia people because it only flows on our reservation. And that's important for me because my research as I, I've come to the University of Arizona. I'm a very strong believer in, you know, by us, of us, and for us. And I'm very privileged to be a part of a lab group that is very strong and, um, you know, believes in that value that I have with that. So my methodology is, um, it's multi-layered. It's bringing in analytical chemistry, uh, field work, and using XO2 multi-parameter sensors. And my research specifically, I'm trying to understand the concentration discharge relationship. Essentially, that means I am trying to figure out how pollutants are behaving as a function of seasonal river discharge. So coalescing these three different avenues of collect, sample collection, using a sensor and analytical chemistry, bringing those together to gain a better understanding of the hydrogeochemical processes of this watershed that we live in. So a little bit of uh, field work. Um, it is really a family affair. The cool thing about doing research at home is I get to involve people at home. 
My twin sister is actually the one in the blue here, um, collecting some field notes. I actually had one of my field helps, who's an absolute gas student, go collect samples for me this morning. So that's um, it. Really is a, a family affair, and it's um, I'm really grateful to be able to do that with the people that I love and the people that I care about. All in all, you know, I'm bringing together understandings of Imajikitu, Chilip Sopo, and our creation story to do the work that I do, and it really is for our future generations. Our future generations are, the, are going to be the leaders, and I want to do everything that I can to ensure that I, I'm fulfilling that promise I have for them. I'm a strong believer that our children deserve the same access to uh, good quality water the same way that our ancestors did. I, when I think about resilience, I think about our children and I think about our ancestors. And then I think about my role and how I, I really do play the same role as my ancestors did just in a different time. And I'm doing everything I can to, to, to fulfill my promise to future generations and to protect this river that means so much to us. So thank you so much, aho gajila. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriela Barra. I'm excited to be here today to talk about my perspectives on resilience. I am a undergrad in environmental science and Mexican American studies, and I'm also a Earth Grant intern. So Earth Grant is a professional um, leadership program that I work with Dr. Monica Ramirez in her integrated environmental science and health risk lab, where I'm assisting with a citizen science project located in Miami, Arizona, looking at their soil quality. So uh, Dr. Ramirez has shared this perspective with me that being resistant in the face of oppression is actually more productive than being resilient, especially for minorities. So this perspective actually comes from a study done by the University of Hong Kong that was called Resistance as a Form of Resilience in Sexual and Gender Minorities that found when um, participants acted in collective action, they actually experienced less depressive symptoms and less perceived discrimination. And these findings are important because we can use this information to improve mental health in our underrepresented identities to reduce minority stress and um, transform negative oppressive experiences into positive ones. So collective action can have many examples. For instance, you can attend peaceful demonstrations or you can discuss injustices with your friends or family. So one example that I have done with this is in this picture, you can see Earth Grant and SEED students who came from all over the country to discuss environmentalism. And this event was very successful because it helped rejuvenate all of our passions in environmental science. But also, we got to sit down outside and have a warm meal together as very tired students. So that brings me to my next point, which is uh, we can actually use rest as another form of resistance. And this idea comes from the book Rest is Resistance by Tricia Hersey who says that people of color have been historically overworked and underpaid and not even paid at all. And in a capitalistic economy, our value is placed on how much labor we can produce. So when we decide to rest instead of producing labor, we are actually acting with resistance. And I say this in a room of, I'm sure, very exhausted and caffeinated professionals. So I want to remind us all that Rest is not earned and we can't pour from an empty cup. And rest is actually a great way for all of us to 
gain agency over our bodies again and over our time and in our energy so that we can fill our cups and be successful at being resilient in the face of oppression when we have to. So with that all being said, I enjoy practicing collective action and of course resting um, by being in these cohorts and having these important discussions and being honest with the workload that I can handle to ensure that I have enough time to sleep, but also eat a healthy meal and have time to exercise and see my family and my community. So with that, I wanna ask you, how are you filling your cup? Thank you. <laughs> Great, I think, Sharon, you've got a big smile on your face because there's some clear emergent themes from across this wide diversity of speakers you brought. Uh, and I think that was the hope, but it's come out so clearly and um, how exciting that is. And how about these student presentations? Who else is blown away? This is incredible. It, it makes me shudder at my own uh, state of being at that age, but I'm, I'm truly impressed. So my name is Greg Collins. Uh, and I've been here for about a year and a half at the University of Arizona. I'm helping lead an effort we're calling the Arizona Initiative for Resilience and International Development. Um, for those interested, would love to talk to you afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of people in this room that are actually involved, Bill, Hannah, and others, uh, in the work that we're trying to do, which is connecting faculty across this university from Mezcoff to CALS to uh, architecture to you name it, geography, economics, uh, two opportunities uh, in the field of international development to support communities and countries and development partners uh, in advancing uh, what Betsy at the beginning and others have referred to an ever-increasing challenge in the face of multiple shocks and stresses. It's also a really good time um, for me to reflect a little bit on the rise of resilience as an analytic, programmatic, an organizing concept in the field of international development because two weeks ago I was back in what is a second home to me, Kenya, in Nairobi uh, with a group of people who were the original architects of Kenya's Ending Drought Emergencies Initiative. Uh, the gentleman on the left here, James Adore, was the lead of that effort. Uh, Izzy Birch uh, represented the EU, I was representing the US government at the time, and Michael Adihama was the uh, technical lead. And 10 years ago, in the wake of a horrific drought event uh, in the Horn of Africa, there was this collective recognition that continuing to treat these crises, though they're anomalies, is extraordinarily costly. Costly in terms of lost livelihoods, lost lives in Somalia alone during that event. A quarter of a million people died, half of them children under five years old. Losses in terms of the cost of humanitarian assistance, billions of dollars just to save lives in the moment, not to support communities to advance their own development ambition. And then in the interest uh, of the Kenya government centrally, losses to, to national regional economy. So it was a very motivating time to begin to rethink about these people, these places that are subject to recurrent crisis, to stop thinking about them as a perpetual humanitarian risk and start to think about what sorts of long-term investments could be made with communities to get ahead of these drought cycles, to break that cycle, uh, and to ultimately uh, not end droughts, but end droughts from becoming uh, uh, emergencies. And Kenya would come to be a model globally for this and inform efforts across Sahelian and West Africa, uh, in Southern Africa, Haiti, and, and a whole bunch of other countries because it was a country-led effort. And like a lot of the speakers have talked to today, it motivated collective action across ministries, across sectors, in the recognition that no single sector had a set of solutions by itself uh, to the challenge of recurrent uh, drought events. So the takeaway there was Kenya became a model that informed a whole bunch of work uh, in a lot of other places. But it was also the beginning of the rise of resilience in the context of international development. Here's some uh, scenes from Northern Kenya, arid landscapes, uh, very similar in fact, uh, to our own arid landscape, characterized largely by mobile livestock keeping as a livelihood. Um, but 
resilience uh, in Kenya, in Sahel and West Africa, uh, in Southern Africa, in Haiti, emerged as a priority for communities and countries dealing with this set of shocks and stresses that were eroding their ability to advance on their own development journeys. Uh, and it brought about a couple of really important shifts as I reflect on it. The first was, I've already mentioned this, this uh, shift in thinking about people in places that are subject to recurrent crisis from treating them as a humanitarian risk to, to treating them as a development priority and listening to their voices to inform their own development ambitions, followed by long-term investment uh, by governments and incentives to bring in the private sector. Another really important shift was a shift from focusing on people's vulnerabilities, deficits, and what's missing, to a focus on assets, abilities, and agency. And that's not a subtle shift. It's actually a huge shift. I spent my early career uh, with the World Food Program as a vulnerability analyst, and it really did cause a shift in my own, uh, own thinking that was really important. And then something we've heard consistently today, it motivated collective action across different types of actors, across different sectors, across ministries. And that's why that Kenyan example is so important to me, because that was a fundamental operational shift in the way we were approaching problem. It wasn't a water problem or a food security problem or a governance problem or a health problem. It was a collective problem that needed to bring those efforts together. Um, I think uh, another really important shift, and Bill's touched on this, I think Hannah touched a little bit on her uh, presentation, was a, re a recognition that the sources of resilience that explain why some households and communities fare better than others are not simply these highly tangible things like access to markets, access to health services, access to water and sanitation, but people's sense of agency and their ability to shape their own future, people's confidence in their ability to adapt social capital and the ability to lean on other households. So these transcendent sources of resilience that don't fit neatly within a sector or a ministry actually matter quite a bit. And I think we're just beginning to truly understand that. So fast forward to today, uh, again, back in Kenya two weeks ago, reimagining a second phase of the Ending Drought Emergencies Initiative, a tremendous amount of momentum, a tremendous amount of success with the first initiative, but the sands are shifting. It's not about a drought every three to five years uh, anymore in Kenya. They're experiencing five consecutive droughts, the lingering impacts of COVID-19, the accelerating impacts of climate change, locusts, and above all, in the latest crisis, the impact of the Ukraine war on the price of food, fertilizer, and fuel. So this extraordinary confluence events are really creating an even greater challenge Kenya is in the lead, they're making great progress, but I think there's an extraordinary opportunity for this university to get more deeply engaged in Kenya, in Sahel and West Africa, in Latin America, to support communities and countries to help deal with these challenges and advance their own development ambition. Our efforts as the Arizona Initiative for Resilience and International Development are help to help you connect to that. So please come talk to us, we'd love to do that, thanks. Hi everybody, how's it going? Thanks for sticking around. Um, so I think I'm last. Um, my name is Dave Moore. I am I'm an ecologist and I'm in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And I started off as an ecologist um, and then I became someone who runs Earth system models. So mo uh, computer models of the entire planet. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, so the question I was posed, uh, posed to myself was, will ecosystems provide climate resilience? We know that ecosystems are influenced by climate, forests, grasslands, deserts, everything is influenced by climate, but they also um, influence climate back. They take up carbon, the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is one of the primary causes of climate change. And so the question is like, well, what, what, what's going to happen? Ecology or ecology has been around for a long, long time. Ecosystems, the term as a scientific term, has only been around since the 30s. And they started doing this by looking at uh, lakes, right? Because lakes are great at, uh, you know exactly how much uh, energy comes in. That energy is translated into carbon, right? Into bodies of plants and animals. And then we've learned that 
the, the, the cycling of carbon around ecosystems is controlled by interactions and it causes amplifying feedbacks and stabilizing feedbacks, things that cause things to grow out of control and things that knock them back. That's how ecology seems to work. Um, now we can measure carbon input and release in lots of different places around the world. So there's a little map up in the corner. All those little dots are, are where we can, we've deployed these um, eddy covariant systems, they're called, but they just, they capture the amount of carbon that comes in and the amount of carbon that goes out. And so we can kind of do this calculation all over the, all over the world. Now, You've probably seen something like this. This is the rise of carbon dioxide over the last, um, over the last, I don't know, since 1960. And we can add up the amount of carbon that went into the atmosphere from all of the anthropogenic emissions because we keep track of that economically. But when we look at the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere, it's less. It's about 50% less. We're getting a 50% discount on our carbon that ecosystems are giving us, right? And so the question is, is this a limited time offer, right? Are they gonna keep providing this buffer against climate change, right? And, and the answer, because we can run these li large giant models, right? The answer is we have no idea, right? So every one of these uh, lines, I call it spaghetti, right? They are, if, if we knew what we were talking about, they'd all be along the same, they'd be going in the same direction. You can see that they agree in the past, and then once we start projecting into the future, we have no idea what's going on, okay? Um, and I run one of these. It's great. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's sobering. Now, a lot of the, you see models in, or papers in nature and science about how the carbon cycle is changing, and they come out every week, right? We talk about them in our, in our, in our class, and they all seem to contradict each other. We don't seem to be getting any worse or getting any better. This plot is from 2014. It's pretty much the same today. Part of the reason is that some of, a, a lot of, we live a very short amount of time. Ecosystems uh, live a long time. They do a lot of things. They do interactions. They have long-term processes. But what we measure, we know that photosynthesis, the amount of carbon coming in, is related to leaf area and nitrogen and temperature and all of these things in the short term. And then if you're, you know, you can put all of these relationships that you make, short-term relationships, into computer models, you can have these nice little, nice little response curves. But when you do that, you're ignoring the interactions and the amplifying feedbacks and the stabilizing feedbacks. You're ignoring the long-term ecological processes. Um, we're ignoring all of these things that we've known about since the 1940s. Because ecologists aren't very good at translating things into mathematical terms, but the, physical, you know, the, the physicists and the chemists and the atmospheric scientists are very good at writing down models. They're both really, 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 really hard things to do. Ecology is hard. Atmospheric science is hard. Um, land surface modeling is hard. They're all hard. They require different skill sets. Um, but when we ignore these um, long-term things, right, our models start from the wrong place and they go in the wrong direction. And we just don't know where they're supposed to go. So, what we try to do in our lab is we try and cross-train ecologists and, and modelers, right? And so since 2008, we've been running a summer course, um, bringing empirical scientists together, ecologi ecological scientists together, and uh, bringing them together with modelers. And then trying to get a quantification of ecological um, processes, the things that make ecosystems work, we're trying to quantify them and add those required processes to these models. So um, really, to know the future, I suppose this is a theme that we've worked on, right? We have to actually talk to each other and we have to work together if we want to answer the bigger questions. And I've just hit ecology and, uh, and, and modeling, right? Think about socio-ecological systems. So that's me, thanks. Oh, let's thank the speakers once again. Thank you all so much. Just terrific. Next, I'm going to call Dave Brashears back up um, to the podium. I'll hand you the mic just to give us some reflection on this second round of presentations that we just heard. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Uh, it was a fantastic set of round of presentations. Um, 
I'll try and make a few brief observations and then sort of challenge you to kind of think about your own takeaways because one of the key messages I think uh, that uh, comes out today is there are so many lenses and filters to sort of see these environmental challenges through. So I'm just offering one perspective here. Um, I think the first, the first point is um, that we see so many diverse environmental issues and challenges um, that, are, that are particularly tough to, to, to face these days. And I think in my own field about the challenge of thinking about how ecosystems work, Dave Moore mentioned that. And uh, in my own classes, we've talked a lot about sort of thinking about threshold type responses and, and differences in, we talk about state and transition models, how a system goes from one state to another and it gets in a, in a state where it's very difficult to bring it back. And those are some of the types of challenges that we're facing now. Um, I think that the second, the second thing besides environmental challenges being tough is that what really came out of a lot of the talks was thinking about our individual relationship with the environment. There's so many different perspectives there. So we heard about very strong cultural linkages from indigenous perspectives. Um, we, we heard about very specific um, individual impacts associated with heat, uh, which is very personal to, to us here in Arizona. Uh, we heard about drought emergencies and the rise of resilience in terms of uh, international development and the challenges that that poses. And then uh, resistance um, in, in terms of environmental issues and inclusivity, uh, so moving beyond resilience. And then, uh, and additionally, in terms of the carbon cycle, will ecosystems provide climate resilience? So thinking about that, that perspective from a very large scale, so to an individual scale, to the whole global scale, thinking about these different perspectives and scales at which we interact with the environment. Um, the third point that I wanna make is thinking about um, the sort of how do we move toward identifying solutions and being adaptable. Um, I think uh, a lot of these, these, these talks relate to sort of co-production of knowledge or identifying community values, thinking about the rigorous science that can go into that, and the many forms of communication that need to be involved to solve problems, or the collective action that has to happen for those. Uh, we also heard about compound impacts that need to be paid attention to in addressing those types of problems. Um, in the, in, uh, from Kathy Jacobs and Greg Garfin and Jim Beiser, I've learned about the, the cycle, the five-step cycle for thinking about adaptation, which I think is very relevant to resilience. And in that cycle, you prepare the groundwork for adaptation, you assess the risks and vulnerabilities to climate change, you identify adaptation options, you assess those adaptation op options, you implement your plan, and then you monitor and evaluate. And I think that theme really fits in with a lot of the issues of resilience that we heard, heard about today, that we need to move towards different levels of communication uh, and engagement that is really co-producing different, different ways that we can, co-producing knowledge that can lead us to different solutions for the many different types of environmental challenges that we're facing today. Um, so I think it's a very exciting time to be in uh, the area of some area of environmental science or envi work related to the environment. Um, I know in natural resources, we're going through a whole paradigm change. We used to think about having sort of a constant set of climate conditions or background conditions that we could operate against and lots of our management plans and uh, uh, management tools were all tied around that. And we're having to come up with new ways and it's, it's a big scramble now. So it's a big opportunity for students to kind of figure out how to think on their feet. And it's a challenging time to teach because I think we're, we're trying to figure out how do you become more adaptable? How will you implement some of these, these uh, approaches to make things more resilient? Um, so I think that's a key, that resilience is a key unifying theme across the university. I think it's, it's been really clearly highlighted how many uh, perspectives we have here today, and I've really appreciated that and got a lot out of that. And so rather than leaving you with my perspective, I'd like you to just 
kind of reflect on your own as we wrap up and I, I turn it back over to Sharon for the next part is just to just think about what's one new insight that you took away today and what's one new opportunity for collaboration and obviously the exercise that you just went through that we all just went through is is a key opportunity for that but I think uh, that's a real key theme for today is the diversity of perspectives and the opportunity for collaboration in challenging in, in addressing kind of the key challenges we have to environmental science, environmental issues and resilience. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Dave is really good at thinking on his feet and I appreciate so much um, him showing up today and moderating our panel and then uh, commenting on the talks that we just heard. So I really appreciate um, all that we've heard today and all that we've seen today and appreciate your participation as the audience, those of you online and in person, all of our speakers and our panelists. And so um, thank you. I, I really have enjoyed and appreciated this afternoon. I'd like to um, thank all of our speakers. I know it was a challenge to um, prepare a talk that was so short, and I really appreciate everyone being mindful of the time and packing so much, so much meaning and so much content into a short five minutes. So I'm definitely feeling, like, like Dave mentioned, like today has been a time of celebration and of motivation and inspiration. I've really enjoyed celebrating the innovative and imaginative work of the folks that spoke to us today who are embracing and exploring concepts of resilience. I'm feeling really motivated by the thoughtful and creative work of our colleagues <clears throat> to explore new ways of knowing and connecting to the work of people across our campus. And I'm certainly inspired by the words that I've heard and the images that I've seen. And I'm hopeful that this afternoon's experiences have transformed your way of thinking in some way toward taking positive action to address the challenges of environmental and societal resilience. So now I get to um, announce a new funding opportunity. This is the really fun part of this afternoon, um, touching on the concept of collaboration that Dave mentioned. So this opportunity is just launching today. I'll spend a couple of minutes um, walking you through this. And this will continue this thread that we've um, taken throughout the day of knowledge discovery and of sharing and learning. So announcing today, um, the Arizona Institute for Resilience is going to fund an interdisciplinary team to develop and execute a creative and inspiring year-long agenda of events and activities focused on a single resilience-related theme of the year for 2023-24. So this was inspired by conversations I've had with folks related to AIR to think about how do we continue these conversations. We have these events where we, where we inspire and, and talk about collaboration. How can we move these activities forward? So what we're going to do here is fund a team that is um, proposing a year-long agenda of events centered around a resilience-related theme. So just to read what's on this slide, we want researchers from highly diverse disciplines to learn from each other about how they approach the same general topic or theme. What questions do they think about? What language do they use? And how might they work together to develop some compelling new projects and proposals? So proposals for the theme of the year will include description of a variety of activities. These may include, but are not limited to, research-focused seminars, workshops, or working groups, public talks that engage broad community audiences, educational field trips, or other student experiences, and film, art, or literary approaches to investigation of and communication on this topic. So the information um, on this slide will, is, is posted um, here it's also going to be on the Perspectives on Resilience event website and we'll also send out an email to everyone because I know you don't have, uh, probably don't have a chance to write this down very quickly. But um, this will be administered through the RII website as all of the um, AIR funding initiatives are. 
And so you will go to this website. It's written here. Um, it's through the RII website. And you'll scroll down to the 2023-24 AIR Annual Resilience Theme Grant. That's the title of this um, opportunity. So the due date is March 17th. So you all have about six weeks to gather together a team of collaborators to identify a theme that you think would be really interesting to explore over the next academic year. And we'll award that team uh, up to $100,000 to um, develop and execute this set of activities. So you may want to hire a graduate student, for example, to help coordinate those activities. You may want to use part of that money as honoraria for speakers or workshop participants or developing a documentary film or some other um, form of communication. So in order to find a team of collaborators, we've also prepared a shared document. It's, a, it's right now, um, when you click on that link, what will pop up is a Google form. So it'll look like a questionnaire where you can write your name, your email address, and then themes that you're interested in and how you might want to be involved in collaborating with others on this theme. So this will also be on the Perspectives on Resilience event website and um, and we'll send that out so that you can um, go to this Google form, type in your information, and then we'll share out the results of that. So there will be a spreadsheet that has all of your names and all of your interests so that you can say, hey, here's somebody else interested in this theme that I really want to explore. And that's a way to kind of facilitate, as, as Sabrina said, um, ways to find each other and ways to um, begin to prepare those collaborations. Oh, so um, I'm really excited to see what proposals come forward for this theme of the year event. And I'm really looking forward to um, the set of activities that will be launched starting in August of 2023 that will enable us as, as a group, as a collective, to continue to investigate, explore, and implement great ideas into solutions. All right, with that, we are coming to the end of our afternoon. I'd like to thank you, thank all of the speakers, and panelists, and you all as participants, both in the room and online. And I need to um, make a special thanks to this amazing team that I've been working with on this event. Um, they are just terrific. So I will name them Amanda Lucero, Shelley Litton, Betsy Woodhouse, Thomas Weiss, Anna Seiferly Valencia, Elisa Beckwith, Ray Granillo, and Maria Johnson. They've just been terrific in helping put together what was a rather logistically complicated event. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be working with such an amazing and excellent team. Thank you. So now uh, we have the opportunity to go out in the courtyard to enjoy some good food, to continue your, con your conversations. We're also going to have live music um, provided by this group. And so I want to um, read just a brief description of, of this um, group of performers. So in collaboration with Arizona Arts Live, we're thrilled to have world-renowned Grammy-nominated Grammy string quartet Brooklyn Rider, just outside this room. Arizona Arts Live is presenting the quartet along with iconic jazz singer Magos Herrera at Centennial Hall tomorrow evening. But they're here this afternoon to do a mini pop-up concert for the first part of our reception. Please get some food and drink and watch a groundbreaking professional string quartet at work here in ENR2. It gets even better. Arizona Arts Live is giving each of you free tickets to tomorrow night's performance. So be on the lookout for your card to redeem at the Centennial Hall box office. Great. So thank you all once again. It's really been a wonderful afternoon. And um, I appreciate you all being here so much. See you out there. <laughs>